Hi everyone, welcome back to another JJ Medicine lesson. This lesson is on giant cell arteritis. So we're going to talk about what this condition is, some of the risk factors and potential pathogenic mechanisms as to why it occurs. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So giant cell arteritis is also known as temporal arteritis, arteritis cranialis, and Horton disease. So giant cell arteritis is a systemic inflammatory vasculitis. Vasculitis is a word meaning inflammation of a blood vessel. So it's often going to be systemic, meaning many blood vessels can be involved. But there is a particular characteristic proclivity of this condition to cause inflammation of the temporal artery. This is why we see the name temporal arteritis as a potential alternative name to this condition. So in this diagram here, we can see that this is the temporal artery. This is going to be the artery that is often characteristically involved in this condition. And then here's another image of the temporal artery on a superficial level. So giant cell arteritis is going to be considered a large vessel vasculitis. So it's going to be characterized as a vasculitis that affects large vessels. But having said that, it can affect small and medium vessels as well. We're going to talk about the different types of blood vessels that are affected in the next slide. And what's characteristic about giant cell arteritis is that it is caused by infiltration of multinucleated giant cells. This is why we have the name giant cell arteritis. So this condition primarily afflicts older patients and the incidence of this condition increases after the age of 50. And the mean age of onset for giant cell arteritis is 75. This is actually the most common systemic vasculitis in adults. And it's associated with a condition known as polymyalgia rheumatica, which we're going to talk about as we go through this lesson as well, because there are important overlaps with these two conditions. And giant cell arteritis is actually estimated to affect anywhere from 5 to 30% of polymyalgia rheumatica patients. So it's quite important to recognize that there are some connections with these two conditions. So we'll talk about those as we go through this lesson as well. Now let's talk about the etiology and associated factors for getting giant cell arteritis. So the etiology of giant cell arteritis is actually unknown, but there are important associated factors that increase the risk of getting this condition. One of them is going to be increasing age. I mentioned this before, the incidence of this condition starts to increase after the age of 50. Being of female biological sex is also another risk factor, and it is estimated that there is a female to male ratio of two to one. Genetics also seem to play a role in whether or not a patient is likely to get this condition. There is an association with HLA-DR4 haplotype and with regards to a polymorphism of the toll-like receptor 4 gene. And there is a higher incidence of giant cell arteritis in individuals of Northern European descent. And along with some of these characteristics, we can also see an important lifestyle factor that can increase the likelihood of having this condition that is smoking. So a past history of smoking or being a current smoker increases the likelihood of having giant cell arteritis. And there is some hypothesis as to whether or not a prior or current infection can actually trigger this condition. Some of these can include the following. Chlamydia pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, parainfluenza, parvovirus B19, and varicella zoster. So these may be related or associated infections, but it's not entirely understood as to if these are simply associated infections or if they are actually triggers for someone that is susceptible to this condition actually getting giant cell arteritis. So just want to mention that here as well. Now let's talk about the blood vessels that can be involved in this condition. We mentioned that giant cell arteritis is categorized as a large vessel vasculitis, but we also mentioned that small and medium vessels can also be affected. So the small vessels that can be affected in this condition include the superficial temporal arteries. So this is where the superficial temporal arteries are located. We can also see the ophthalmic arteries being affected as well. These are going to supply the eyes. We can also see the occipital arteries being affected. This is where the occipital arteries are located. And we can also see vertebral arteries being affected and the posterior ciliary arteries being affected. So here is where the vertebral artery in this diagram here. Now with regards to the medium and large vessels, these are going to include the aorta. So the aorta is the large branch off the heart. We can also see the carotid arteries being affected. So here is the common carotid. We can also see the subclavian arteries being affected. So the subclavians are located here. And then the iliac arteries. The iliac arteries are going to be in the groin. So again, we can see a wide variety of different blood vessels being affected in this condition. And some of the most important ones are, are going to be these large and medium sized blood vessels, but some of the small vessels are going to be important in determining the signs and symptoms we can see. So we're going to talk about that 
as we go through this lesson as well. So now let's take a brief look at the pathogenesis behind this condition. If we were to actually look at a blood vessel and we were to actually look at the different layers of a blood vessel, the outside would be the adventitia and we've got the media layer and the intima. Now, the pathophysiology of this condition is mediated by cell-mediated immunity. And there is some question as to whether or not the initiation of the cell-mediated immunity is started or triggered by endothelial injury. So endothelial injury would be injury to the inside of the blood vessel. This may be related to smoking. Smoking is an often important cause of endothelial injury. Whatever the trigger may be, what will happen is that monocytes, which are a type of immune cell, will be recruited to the adventitia. Then what will happen is that when the monocytes enter into the adventitia, they can be differentiated into other types of immune cells, including macrophages and giant cells. So again, these multinucleated giant cells are where the name giant cell arteritis comes from, and they're going to be the textbook characteristic finding in this condition. And all of these immune cells within the adventitia are going to cause inflammation. And you can imagine that if there's inflammation, there's going to be impingement of the blood vessel. There's going to be constriction of the blood vessel, and that's going to cause a lot of the signs and symptoms, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. So let's talk about those signs and symptoms now. So one of the signs and symptoms of this condition is a headache. So we talked about a lot of those blood vessels that are affected in this condition, and they supply the head. So you can imagine that if there's constriction or impingement of those blood vessels, we're going to have a headache or there's going to be issues with head pain. Now, this is actually so common, in fact, that 75% or roughly 75% of giant cell arteritis patients will have a headache. This is actually going to be the most common initial symptom in 33% of cases. And what's important to take away here is that it is going to be a new or a new type of headache in patients over the age of 50. Again, the incidence of this condition starts to increase after the age of 50. And then if a patient starts to have a new type of headache, a headache they've never had their whole life, then that's going to be a red flag for a potential issue. So any new headache that occurs after the age of 50 is often going to be a red flag. But in this case for giant cell arteritis, this is going to be what we want to look for. And again, the reason that we see a headache is that those temporal arteries and the occipital arteries are going to be constricted due to inflammation. And we can often see temporal and or occipital areas of the head being affected. So the occipital area is going to be the back of the head. The temporal area is going to be along the sides of the head. And the headache is often going to be described as throbbing or continuous in nature. And with regards to the temporal artery being affected, again, that's going to be a very characteristic artery that is affected in this condition. Tenderness to palpation over the superficial temporal artery may occur. So if you'd actually see the temporal artery on someone's head and you actually touch it, and if there's tenderness to palpation, if there's pain, then that can be a sign of this condition as well. Now, the headache itself may not occur in all patients, especially in those with isolated extracranial vessel involvement. So although we talk about this as going to be the number one clinical finding in this condition, it may not occur in all patients if they have only blood vessels that are affected like the aorta or the subclavian arteries and not any in the head that may also occur so they wouldn't have a headache. So I just want to mention that here as well. Now some other important signs and symptoms in this condition include neck pain, shoulder, torso, and hip pain. Now for those that have a medical background, pain in these sites may trigger a thought of a particular condition and that condition is polymyalgia rheumatica. This is the condition we talked about before that has a lot of overlap with giant cell arteritis. This is actually going to be the second most common initial symptom, in fact. So neck pain, shoulder, torso, and hip pain is actually going to be relatively common. It can occur as an initial symptom in 25% of patients. And as mentioned before, up to 30% of PMR patients can have giant cell arteritis. But if you have giant cell arteritis, up to 55% of GCA patients can have some of these polymyalgia rheumatica symptoms. So again, very important overlap here. Now we can also see constitutional symptoms occurring in GCA as well. These can include malaise and fatigue. So malaise and fatigue can actually be an initial finding in 20% of patients and this can be a relatively common finding that can occur in 50 to 60% of patients. And fever can also occur in GCA patients as well which often affects an estimated one-third of patients and weight loss can occur but it's less common. Now I just want to briefly segue here to talk about some of the connections between polymyalgia rheumatica and giant cell arteritis. There is question as to whether or not these are actually the same condition, whether or not 
one is simply on one side of the spectrum and the other is on another side of the spectrum. So I just want to mention that here again because as we've seen, there are very high percentages in each patient group. If a patient has PMR, they're more likely to have GCA. If a patient has GCA, they're more likely to have PMR. So there has been a hypothesis as to whether or not they may actually be the same condition or different manifestations of the same condition. Some other signs and symptoms that can occur in GCA include jaw claudication. So jaw claudication is going to be a jaw pain. This is going to occur in 40% of patients. It's a discomfort or fatigue of jaw muscles. So it can occur after eating or talking. And this is actually going to have a very high predictive value, in fact. So if a patient has jaw claudication, they have some of these other symptoms we talked about before, like a headache, this is actually going to be a very important finding to recognize. And in some patients, they may have tongue infarction. So there may be some cessation of blood flow to the tongue. So that would be where the tongue becomes infarcted. And that's actually going to be pathognomonic for GCA. So if they have tongue infarction, they automatically are diagnosed with this condition. Visual disturbances and visual loss can also occur as well. We talked about the ophthalmic artery being involved. This is actually going to be an important preventable cause of vision loss that can occur rapidly over the course of three days. This is going to be, again, a very important finding to look out for. This is going to be something that may initially be a transient visual loss, but it may rapidly progress to permanent visual loss. And it's going to be painless. It's going to be a painless visual blurriness or vision loss. And this can affect up to 50% of patients as well. Now we can also see a tenderness of the scalp in GCA. We can also see a cough and sore throat. This can occur in 5 to 10% of patients. And then some other less common findings can include limb claudication. So that is, again, that discomfort and fatigue of the lower limbs. This can be something that can be found in those that have iliac artery involvement. Transient ischemic attacks, or TIAs, can also occur. We can see scintillating scotomas occurring, so that's a visual disturbance. Carpal tunnel syndrome, diplopia, ptosis, and hearing difficulties. These are all potential findings in GCA as well. These are going to be less common than a lot of the ones we talked about before. So diplopia is going to be double vision, and ptosis is going to be drooping eyelid. Now let's talk about how a clinician diagnoses this condition. So if a clinician sees a patient that comes in with these signs and symptoms, especially the headache, the jaw claudication, the visual loss or visual disturbance, it's going to be very key points to make note of when we see the patient. So what the clinician is going to do is that they're going to do blood work. And what they can see in blood work is that there's an increase in acute phase reactants. This is going to be a hallmark finding in GCA. So acute phase reactants are going to include ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate, it's going to be high in GCA. And in GCA, ESR is going to be equal to or greater than 50. And we're also going to see high C-reactive protein or CRP. And this is not a very specific measurement, but if it is negative, for instance, if we were to actually see a patient that we suspect has GCA, that we check their C-reactive protein, if it's negative, if it's very low or normal, that has a negative predictive value. It's makes it very unlikely that the patient actually has GCA. So they're going to have high CRP, and if they have very low CRP, that can often be an indication that they don't have GCA. We can also see thrombocytosis, so high platelet count can be found in this condition as well. And then some other markers that can be elevated include alpha-2 globulin, fibrinogen, and interleukin-6. Now, what's going to be very important with regards to GCA diagnosis is going to be a superficial temporal artery biopsy. This is the standard diagnostic procedure, although not all cases will be diagnosed in this fashion. So what can be noted on this biopsy is vasculitis, granulomatous inflammation, mononuclear invasion, and presence of those multinucleated giant cells. And besides the biopsy, another method of diagnosis can involve color duplex ultrasonography of the superficial temporal artery. And again, these Diagnostic methods are only going to be applicable if the superficial temporal artery is involved. But as I mentioned before, it's often characteristically involved. If we were to actually do a color duplex ultrasonography, we can see what we would call an observation of a dark halo around the vessel. This is the classic halo sign. Now, other imaging modalities may be used. These can include MRI and MRA. So MRA can be used to assess the scalp vessels. So this can especially be utilized in patients that have scalp tenderness. A PET scan with 18 fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG uptake, and then a CTA as well. So these are some diagnostic methods and procedures, but there is a diagnostic criteria. In fact, there are multiple diagnostic criteria for this condition. 
One of them is one I have here, which is adapted from the American College of Rheumatology. This is their diagnostic criteria for GCA. So their diagnostic criteria involves, one, that the patient is greater than 50 years old, two, that there is a new headache that is localized, three, that there's tenderness to palpation over the temporal artery, four, that ESR measurement is equal to or greater than 50, five, that there's a positive arterial biopsy result. And with regards to this particular diagnostic criteria, you have to have at least three of these. So at least three of any of these is enough to say that the patient has GCA. And once GCA has been diagnosed, it can be subdivided into cranial GCA and large vessel GCA. Cranial GCA involves the cranial vessels, but large vessel GCA involves the large vessels, so the aorta and subclavian arteries. The large vessel GCA is actually something that occurs more frequently in female biological patients, so 88% will have large vessel GCA, whereas male patients are more likely than female patients to have cranial GCA, so I want to mention that here as well. Let's talk about the treatment of GCA. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? So what's very important with regards to treatment of this condition is high-dose corticosteroid therapy. So this can involve either oral prednisone, 40 to 100 milligrams per day, so these are very high doses, or IV methylprednisolone. So if they're in hospital, they can be on IV steroids. High-dose corticosteroid therapy is extremely important as it reduces the risk of vision loss. So this is why high-dose corticosteroid therapy is so important to reduce the risk of vision loss. Because what can happen is if these high-dose corticosteroids are started fast enough, there is a 22-fold increased chance of improvement of vision if steroids are started the first day of visual symptom onset. And as I mentioned before, visual damage and visual loss can occur rapidly, and it can become irreversible if left untreated for greater than 48 hours. Now, that's why clinicians may see a patient that comes in and they may only have a few of the symptoms we talked about, but it may be enough for the clinicians to be suspicious of GCA. And even before getting a full diagnosis, they may not go through biopsy. They may not do those imaging that we talked about before. They may start the patient immediately on high-dose corticosteroid therapy if they see a patient with visual disturbance and some of these other symptoms, simply because starting the high-dose corticosteroid therapy as fast as possible is going to reduce the risk of vision loss. So that's why some clinicians will just jump to treatment of this condition with high-dose corticosteroids before getting a full diagnosis, especially if they have visual symptoms. So once the high-dose corticosteroid therapies started, the systemic symptoms will be the first to improve. They often improve within 72 hours. Those are going to be the fatigue and malaise and some of the other ones that we talked about before. And what will be important with regards to treatment is that clinicians will continue treatment until symptom resolution. Then treatment may occur for many years. And then once a patient has been on corticosteroids for so long, they have to slowly taper to allow their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis to start to respond back on its own. Now, another possible treatment that can be used in some patients is low-dose aspirin or 81 milligrams. There is some evidence showing that low-dose aspirin can reduce risk of vision loss and thrombosis. So I just want to mention that here, but it's not going to be the hallmark treatment of this condition. It's going to be the high-dose corticosteroid therapy. And then some other corticosteroid sparing treatments can include the immunosuppressants like azathioprine, methotrexate, and cyclosporine. These can also be used for some patients with GCA as well. And then the last treatment I want to mention here is a potential newer treatment known as an interleukin-6 receptor blocker, which is tocilizumab. So we didn't mention this with regards to the pathophysiology of this condition, but interleukin-6 seems to play a role in the pathophysiology. We did mention this briefly when we talked about the diagnosis, when we said that we can see higher levels of interleukin-6. So that's why we may see some newer treatments for this condition involving IL-6 receptor blockers like tocilizumab. So I want to mention that here as well. If you want to learn more about other rheumatological conditions, please check out my rheumatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.